Hey everybody, Chris here from Varsity Gaming, and welcome back to another episode of Siege School. Today's topic is going to be covering roaming, which for those of you who don't know, is leaving the objective to intercept or flank the attacking team as a defender. It's a strategy that sees a lot of play in the higher levels, as having everyone on site is generally a really bad idea. I think I can speak for most of us is that when we all started the game, a lot of us all stayed on site and would never leave. I know back when I got into the beta, everyone would just sit on site, five people on site, no one left. Obviously that's not the best strategy as it is very easy to pick you off as you're hiding on site. For almost every objective, there's too few places to hide, so having five people cramped in one area or one room usually leads to pretty easy deaths. All the attacking team has to do is drone you out, know where you are, and shoot you, as you really don't have many other places to hide. So what this means is that your team should have roamers. On the overall, any operator can roam, but the best ones are definitely the ones with 3 speed and 1 armor. The reasoning for this is because they can get around the map very quickly, and they make very little noise while doing it. If you've ever tried to run with a 1 speed operator, you can hear them from a mile away. Meanwhile, sprinting as a 3 speed operator does make a lot of noise, but it is much, much less than any 1 speed. And the biggest difference is when you're slow walking. And since slow walking is such a crucial element, that's why it does not work that well when you roam as a one speed operator. Slow walking as a one speed operator still makes a lot of noise and can still be heard very, very easily. Meanwhile, like I said, a three speed operator slow walking is very hard to hear. So even in your quietest state as a one speed operator, people are probably gonna be able to hear you, which really is not good if you're trying to go for a flank. Now while I say roaming as a one speed operator can be rough, it can be done. Really the only requirement for a good roamer is to have a lot of map knowledge. A one speed operator with a lot of map knowledge is always going to be better than a three speed operator with absolutely no map knowledge. You can't expect someone to pull off a successful flank if they don't even know how to flank and get there in the first place. Now unfortunately map knowledge is a very broad topic and is very hard to cover so I'm not going to be covering this video but I might do it in future seed school videos if there's interest. And probably the second most important component of roaming is good callouts. I know based on comments and what people have told me during stream that a lot of you guys play solo queue because you don't have people who want to play siege. Like I said, unfortunately there's not much you can do here, you just gotta hope for good teammates or try to communicate as much as you can and hopefully they'll communicate back. But if you are in a squad, callouts are huge. If your anchors on site can tell you where the people are pushing from and what rooms they're in by going on cameras or even just seeing them, it gives you a huge step up when you can flank. Instead of pushing blind and not knowing exactly where they are, you can set up your place so you know exactly where to go through and what hallway and be able to push them and get a few kills before they even notice you're there. So to summarize, if you know where they are and you know how to get there, you're pretty much going to be their worst nightmare. And the third one is knowing when to return to site. I notice this a lot in ranked games, especially on stream, when randoms are the roamers. A lot of the time someone will roam and they just don't know when to go back to site. I can't tell you how many times we've had everyone on site die and the randoms are still roaming trying to go for a flank. At that point when everyone's dead on site, you've pretty much already lost the game if your roamer's not ready to kill them all immediately. Now I will say right before I get into this segment that there is no blanket rule of when you should get back to site. It's very situational, but after a while you kind of get the hang of it and for the most part you'll be able to make the right call, I'd say probably 75% of the time. There's always that 25% of the time where maybe choosing the other option would have been the better choice. So my personal method for determining if I should get back to site is looking at the kill feed. If only say one person on your team dies, that's not really time to panic yet. But if you start noticing that your teammates are getting picked off every 10 seconds or so, and you can still hear the firefight going on, then it's definitely time to get back to site as soon as possible. This is where call-outs become important. If your teammates are telling you that they're under a lot of pressure and that people are going to be pushing them really soon, then you need to help them as soon as you can. Having a roamer that doesn't come back to site is as useful as having someone who's AFK. Just because the situation is not perfectly how you imagined it would be, doesn't mean you can't come and help. Alright, now I'm going to talk about the prep phase. So during the prep phase, the defending team only has 45 seconds really to put down all their stuff before the attackers get to move. This is something I want to give you guys my personal opinion about that I've had a lot of other people argue against me for, but I think I might be in the right. It's up to you guys to decide. So 45 seconds really is not that much time. Most of the top tier roamers have a lot of stuff to put down. And most teams will say that all three speed operators should go to get hatches or walls off site as they're the fastest to get there. Personally, I would disagree. Every team should have one or two anchors. This will usually be Rook, Smoke, or Doc, someone heavy and who doesn't really need to leave site. 
I personally think those people should always be the ones to get hatches or put down stuff off-site. My reasoning for this is because operators like Jaeger, who have 3DSs, 2 barbed wire, and 2 reinforcements, will pretty much have their entire prep phase taken up by putting stuff down and won't have time to get off-site. Meanwhile, someone like Doc only has 2 barbed wire and 2 reinforcement. All he has to do is just go upstairs, get the hatches, come back downstairs, put down barbed wire. And by doing this, you're allowing Jaeger to get the walls on site, which are much closer and will save a lot of time, and he'll probably have about 15 seconds to get to a spot wherever he needs to roam. That way you won't have situations asking people, oh, where'd you put down your gadgets? And they're like, oh, I didn't, I needed to leave site, so I didn't use any of my gadgets. I personally think it works out for the better a lot of the time, but it's up for you guys to decide, as I really don't think I'm the ultimate say in this matter. Now I will add on to the end of this is that a lot of time, People prefer this method so that they have time to go to their spawn peak corner and will be able to line up their shop before the round even starts. I personally don't condone spawn peaking or spawn killing so I really won't be talking about that in this video or probably any future seed school episodes because I just think it ruins the game. Obviously that's more personal preference but if you are someone who does like to spawn cover spawn peak, usually this method works because then you have more than enough time for your 3 speed operators to get to wherever they need to be to peak. Alright now I'm going to talk about my personal tier system for the best roamers in the game and the worst roamers. Keep in mind that all my experience is from PC. This definitely differs from console as there are some operators that are much more powerful on console simply because of how people play the game on there and how they respond to different situations. All right, we're gonna start with the best roamers. Personally, I think there are three, Jaeger, Bandit, and Pulse. The reason why I think these three are the best is their guns and their speed. They're all three speed operators and have very powerful guns. Jaeger has the only assault rifle on the entire defensive team Bandit has an SMG with a lot of power and a lot of fire rate, as well as having an ACOG, which also is an added bonus to Jaeger. And Pulse just has straight up wall hacks while also having a very powerful gun with very low recoil. So if you're ever looking to have at least two roamers on your team, then make sure to pick one of these two. I think in almost any situation, they will come out on top compared to any other operator. Alright, now moving on to mid-tier. I think there are only really two mid-tier operators, Cavietta and Valkyrie. Both of these operators are good for intel and for flanking. Caviera can silent step and walk around the map without the enemies hearing her and can really get a good flank off and if she manages to get an interrogation during her flank it can completely turn the tide of the entire match. And Valkyrie is really good because of her intel. You can put down cameras in locations where you know people are going to push through and when you go to flank you can quickly hop on the camera, see where they are and prepare your shot before you're even looking at them. Alright moving on to the low tier. I think there are four low tier operators for roaming. Capcan, Castle, Dock, and Frost. Capcan is usually considered a roamer because half the time he's caught out while placing his traps. Because he is a one speed operator, it takes forever for him to go from one side of the map to the other. And usually a good Capcan will stagger their traps, which involves a lot of moving around the map. And so really your best bet is just kind of slowly walk around and hope to flank someone while they're pushing or get someone with your traps. Now the reason why I say Castle is a low tier roamer is because he still has the same guns as Pulse, it's just really his kit does not combo well with roaming at all. Now Doc's an interesting pick that was very prevalent before but I don't think as much anymore. The reason why a lot of people like Doc was because if say he gets downed in a firefight he can revive himself and doesn't need anyone to come get him. And he is absolutely crucial in those situations where it's a 1v1 and you both down each other and you can just pick yourself back up and then finish off the other person. Obviously those situations are a lot more rare but the one time it does happen can very much spell the difference between win or loss for your team. And the last of the low tier roamers is Frost. The reason why she's low tier is because her gun is actually one of the most powerful in the defensive team. It has just as much damage as Jaeger's assault rifle, but it has a much slower fire rate. And on top of that, she's also a two-speed operator. She just won't be able to deal as much damage quickly, and she won't be as quiet as Jaeger. On top of that, her kit really does not promote roaming at all. Her kit is very much an anchor or close to sight role, but you can still walk around with her if you want. And now the leftover operators are what I would call non-roamers. Those consist of Rook, Smoke, Tachanka, Mute, Mira, and Echo. Rook has an ANCOG and he's very slow, so he can just stay on site and hold angles if he needs to and shoot out of sight to whoever's trying to peek in. Smoke has gas canisters which he can use in the last 30 seconds to deny entry and is very useful for a last second push which a lot of attacking teams try to pull. Tachanka is just downright useless so he's definitely not a roamer. Mute actually has a pretty decent gun with his MP5K but I would definitely say his kit very much promotes staying on site. Mira is the definition of an anchor. Her kit is really only useful on site and putting it off site just pretty much gives the enemy team an advantage so you never want to leave site with her unless absolutely necessary. And Echo is kind of a mixed bag and I wasn't really sure where to put him but ultimately I decided on a non-roamer. I personally think Echo is much more suited to stay on site and use his drone to disorient enemies as they're pushing in. This way when they're disoriented you have the advantage in a 1v1 fight. Alright and that concludes the information segment of the show for today. 
Now we're going to move on to the game show aspect. For those of you who have never watched an episode before, basically what I'm going to do is ask you guys a question, give you 10 seconds on the clock, and you guys have to come up with an answer. After the 10 seconds, I will give you my answer and why I think it's right, and it's up to you guys to determine whether your answer is right or wrong. Remember, like I say every time, there never is one right answer. There's always multiple answers to every situation. I just try to give you my personal take on it. And after all the questions are asked, I'll put up a scoring on the screen based on how many questions you got right. With all that said, let's jump into the first question. Question 1. A drone spots you while you're roaming, then stops moving. What do you do? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up. So this is a situation that's happened to me a lot of times, and I always try to remember not to tunnel vision when this happens. Really the best thing you can do if a drone sees you and then just stops moving altogether is to just get out of your current position. What a lot of higher tier players try to do is use the drone to line up their shot. So a move in the drone just try to get a small peek at you, see where you are, and then line up a shot through the wall or a window. And the reason they do this is to give you very little time to actually get out of position. So when you're caught in a place and you see a drone coming at you and you can't kill it, and then all of a sudden it just stops moving, just get out. Question 2. How many roamers is too many? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. And time's up. So this question's a little tricky. Every site is different depending on the map and the game mode. In my personal experience, I've found that bomb usually has more people on site than they have roaming, where a secure area usually has more people roaming than they have on site. The reasoning for this is obviously because bomb has two objectives to defend while secure area only has one. And the added bonus about secure area is that you know when they are on site as it immediately tells you that they're contesting it. Whereas bomb, they could be on site and you wouldn't even know. Unless one of your anchors tells you. And I won't even get into hostage because honestly that game mode is such a huge shit show that anything I say here really won't apply to it. If you want a universal rule, I would definitely say that four roamers is too many. Three I'd say is for the most part pushing it, and two I think is perfect. Question three. This one's a bit of a scenario as well. You flanked the attackers and picked off one that was straggling from the group. What should you do after the first kill? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. Time's up, and the answer is run. So this is more personal preference based off experience. In the past, whenever I flanked an enemy and the rest of the group was kind of close by, it usually led to my death if I kept pushing. The issue is since the rest of the attackers aren't within sight, it's very hard for you to line up a second shot without getting killed. Assuming you're playing decent people, they will probably call out immediately that they were flanked, and then the rest of the team will turn around looking for you. So if you keep trying to push from the same direction, they're going to know where to expect you. I personally find that the best course of action is to kill someone, and then leave and try to find another way to where they are. On the overall, people might not like this answer because I know a lot of people like to just keep pushing the flank that they were already pushing before, but I honestly find that most of the time it's not worth it. Getting the one kill is good, but dying immediately after isn't always the best for your team. Obviously going one for one is better than getting no kills at all, but you should always be trying to go for maximum amount of kills if you can, especially when roaming. So if you can leave, go through another safe area and get another kill, that's just so much better for your team than just trying to push and dying because they know exactly where you are. Alright, that's it for the normal questions. Now we're going to move on to the bonus question. Today I only did three questions because the episode did run a little long and I didn't want to take up too, too much of you guys' time and rant for too long. But anyways, here's the bonus question. As Jaeger, should you ever put down any gadgets or reinforcements? With 10 seconds on the clock, go. And time's up. The answer to the bonus question is, of course not. As Jaeger, you need to get to the other side of the map and try to spawn kill only to die immediately, so you don't have time to put down your gadgets and your reinforcements. And plus your team needs someone to blame for when the attackers manage to push in and kill everyone easily since you have no barbed wire or no ADSs down. Remember, as Jaeger, you are the punching bag. You're the one that fucks up and lets everyone else bully you for it. Alright guys, that concludes today's episode of Siege School. Hopefully you guys learned something new today. This episode was a bit of a challenge for me as it's a very broad topic and it was very hard for me to pinpoint exact pieces of information I wanted to talk about. So if you guys don't mind, please let me know in the comments down below what you think of this episode. I feel like it was a bit all over the place, but I'm hoping it actually went through okay. And as promised at the beginning of the video, here are the scores based on the questions in this video. 
again, let me know how well you guys did in the comments down below. I'm interested to see how many people are getting these questions right and if they need to be harder or easier or what. And lastly, before I go, two small plugs. One, the Siege School shirt is now available on the store. Links are on the screen and in the description below. And two, I do stream Siege every single day. I start at noon Eastern Standard Time every day and I play for about three to five hours. So if you want to watch me play Siege and explain why I'm doing what I'm doing, then make sure to tune in by following the link on the screen or in the description below. And that is it for me today, guys. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next episode of Seed School. Take care.